Time passes and the world changes. Animals evolve and animals disappear. One animal for more than a million years was North America's mightiest predator. It's gone now. But what was it like? What did it eat? How did it kill? This is the story of the reconstruction and virtual resurrection of the terrible saber-toothed tiger. Smilodon fatalis, the saber-toothed tiger. As legendary prehistoric predators go, it was very recent. So recent that humans were around to see it, compete with it, maybe even be killed by it. It was bigger and stronger than any of today's big cats. And it had a pair of weapons that today's cats only have miniature versions of. It had seven inch long canine daggers designed to slice straight through the flesh of its victims. But the question is why? Why did it need them? And how did it use them? For more than a hundred years, paleontologists have been working on this mystery. But it's only now, with advances in computer modeling and creative engineering, that an accurate picture of this killer is beginning to take shape. The true story of the saber-tooth is ready to be told. Paleontologist Larry Martin has been on the trail of Smilodon the saber-tooth for more than 30 years. He and forensic expert Virginia Naples have been digging for clues about how the animal lived and especially how it killed. For this, bones of prey animals are important. We have to take the evidence that we get from the fossil record and like Sherlock Holmes, use that evidence to deduce what they were really like. That's beautiful. That is neat. It's in great that's condition. A, that's a really good find. That's probably... In modern downtown Los Angeles, prehistory continually bubbles up. This is the paleontological miracle known as the Rancho La Brea Tar Pits, pools of sticky asphalt that for tens of thousands of years have been trapping unwary animals. They trap them and suck them under, kill them cleanly, and then, an eternity later, offer up their bones for study. In the past century alone, the tar pits have yielded 166,000 Smilodon bones producing a better understanding of the saber-tooth than of almost any other prehistoric predator. We know practically everything there is to know about the skeleton of Smilodon. On the other hand, there are a lot of things we don't know about what it looked like. We don't know whether it was striped or had spots. We don't know how it behaved, whether it was social or solitary. We don't know precisely how it killed its prey. And we can speculate about it, or we can try to be real scientists and do experiments. And that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to see how a saber-toothed cat killed its prey by building one. Larry's plan is to build a working replica of Smilodon's head and use it to savage an animal carcass to see exactly how the teeth kill. The man recruited to build the head is Todd Wheeler a mechanical engineer who shares Larry's passion for the saber-tooth. So three, seven, six, eight. Okay. Now we're not gonna Doing the crazy thing occasionally is fun. And delivering people with the unexpected can be even more fun. Joining the paleontologist and the engineer is anatomical artist Maurizio Anton. He specializes in using both fossils and existing animals to bring prehistoric creatures back to life.
He takes what he knows to a team of computer animators, and together they work up from the basics. It looks great. The idea is little by little to rebuild the animal with absolute accuracy. Something that will look and move exactly like the real thing. If we are very careful with every detail, we can at least hope to, to have created a, a very likely, a very probable likeness of uh, an extinct species as such. Smilodon was still on Earth and in North America at the end of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. That means it was around when the first humans arrived, at least 13,000 years ago. But this was a case of a very recently evolved mammal, the humans, overlapping with the last of an ancient dynasty. Sixty-five million years ago came the violent end of the age of the dinosaurs. And with the dinosaurs gone, the dawn of the age of mammals. From the minute to the mighty, mammals took over the Earth. Like all dominant creatures before them, they eventually evolved into a majority of plant eaters. And a fierce minority of meat eaters. One of the marks of a meat eater is its teeth, especially the long canines for stabbing and tearing. But there are long canines and long canines, saber teeth. This tooth design doesn't exist at the moment, but for much of the multi-million year history of the mammals, it was the trademark of the most powerful predators and usually went with a large muscular body. Not all the early saber-toothed animals were as sleek and feline as Smilodon nor were they all necessarily related. So how did it hunt? The shape of the body is a clue to that, and the body is what the team intends to recreate in the computer. Maurizio takes animator John Kay to the Wills Museum in Bristol to have a look at a smiled and skeleton. Scary creature. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. The size of the, t the tail is really, really short. Sure. Yeah, I think in, in life uh, it would be like the tail of a uh, bobcat or a uh, lynx. A bobtail yeah. and a strong arched That's, spine. Uh, Both carry implications about the way the animal moved, especially when it was hunting. Back to the computer and to basics. The bones and joints are reduced to two-dimensional sticks, but moving sticks and Maurizio gets his first glimpse of how an animal shaped like Smilodon would have to walk. That's a slightly lighter walk. Great, great. Yeah, it's coming alive, huh? This is the first big stride towards recreating the animal. But even when the team gets to the point where they've added muscles, flesh and fur, there'll still be one thing the computer won't be able to help them with. How did saber teeth work? How did they kill? Something so long could be a liability, easily breaking, perhaps, against a prey animal's bone. And yet they must have been useful. But how? Working that out is engineer Todd Wheeler's part of the job. For guidance in building his mechanical jaw, he takes the saber teeth to dental expert Professor Holliston Riviere. One of the first things that we wanted to do to help Todd with the um, engineering part of this was to look at these serrations to document what they looked like so that when he made molds of them for the purpose of trying out various bite strategies he could then come back to the pictures that we took and be sure that the serrations were in fact accurate first of all and secondly to determine what kind of wear he was getting as he uh, utilized them over and over again. What Todd sees under the microscope are serrations that are much finer than he expected and edges that become blunted with age. Driving a tooth like this through flesh would obviously take a lot of muscle. Back at his workshop, 
Todd starts to adapt all the details of the teeth to the model he's building. And when the teeth are right, he starts on the jaws, cutting them to match exactly the jaws in Smilodon's skull. Then, he has to do something that goes beyond just copying the jaws. He's going to operate them with a mechanical excavator and has to work out how much force to apply, how powerful Smilodon's bite was. According to Professor Blair van Valkenburg, an expert on jaws and teeth, it was one of the most powerful ever. In saber-tooth, they had huge muscles that came off their necks and inserted on the base of their skull and would have pulled the head downwards at the same time as the jaws coming upward. This would have really increased their bite force tremendously and allowed them to drive these huge sabers and incisors through the flesh of their prey. If a creature with teeth this long is going to use them effectively, it's going to get them poised to stab an animal. Its mouth will have to open almost as wide as a yawning hippo's. To do that, and then to slam the teeth through tough skin, the neck and jaw muscles would have to be massive. The, the shape of the jaw is adapted uh, to, to allow these muscles to act from a very wide uh, gape initially. Right. Right. So from this 90 degree or even 100 degree gape, uh, the muscles can pull and bring the mandible to position during the killing bite. Mm -hmm. All that muscle on Smilodon's head and neck would have given it a formidable profile as it stalked the grazing animals of America at the end of the Pleistocene. But what animals would those have been? And how exactly did it bring them down? At the climax of a hunt, every cat uses its teeth. But the way it uses them, and the way it hunts, correspond to the way the cat is built. Smilodon was no bigger than today's largest cats. But the muscles in its upper body and hind legs made it a lot stockier and heavier than any of them. In fact, Larry's reading of the skeleton makes the animal very unlike cats as they're now known. He suggests that it may have had more resemblance to another kind of meat eater. Saber-toothed cats got to be about the size of modern lions, but they must have been considerably more fearsome. For one thing, they're built differently. They're not built the way that other cats are. They're commonly built like bears, and while they might not have been able to run as fast as a lion, they'd be a lot stronger and more powerful. And when you consider the fact they're carrying a six-inch knife, they'd be a lot more dangerous. Like all cats, Smilodon would have been capable of bursts of speed, but it wouldn't have been able to run down prey. Not with its heavy shoulders, bobbed tail, and short hind legs. Cats that specialize in speed are built like this, the cheetah the world's fastest land animal. It has a lanky, light frame, a spine like a spring, and a long tail that acts as a counterbalance. In the open country where it lives, it can chase prey for long distances, jinking and cutting and finally outrunning it. It hunts this way because there's no place for it to hide and stalk. But Smilodon had to get close to its prey and then spring on it. Where the cheetah has speed, Smilodon had strength, and where the cheetah hunts in open land, Smilodon inhabited a more densely vegetated world. Smilodon would have been more like a leopard, another stocky, short-legged cat that uses the cover of both bush and darkness to sneak up on the animals it kills. But what I think dirt tooth cats did is they went down to an area where there was a, a, a sufficient amount of cover, some brush, uh, probably near a water hole, and they waited for animals to come by. 
And when they got very close to them, what they would do is they run out of ambush and they run alongside the animal and they grab a hold of it. In the last ice age, the area around Los Angeles didn't look like this. Even if you subtract the city, it wasn't the desert. It was cool and relatively lush. And to go by evidence from the tar pits, there were a lot of different kinds of animals around. Bison, mammoths, horses, camels, giant sloths. With such a variety of prey to choose from, which of these animals was Smilodon most likely to hunt? The whole idea of carrying a knife is to be more dangerous than your body size would otherwise predict. Now, the biggest of these saber-toothed cats are about the size of the largest lions and tigers. So we could suppose they attacked animals somewhat bigger than modern lions and tigers usually attack. Modern lions and tigers usually draw the line on things like 2,000 pound buffaloes or things like that. Lions make up for size differences by hunting in a group. But even then, a 1,500 pound buffalo is no pushover. As well as being big and strong, a buffalo is ferocious. And it's not unusual for attacking lions to be injured or even killed. In Pleistocene America, the bison were about a fifth larger than bison today, and probably as tall in order as today's African buffalo. Even for Smilodon, attacking one would have been a dangerous gamble. Something the fossils from the tar pits confirm. Many of the Smilodon bones show severe battle wounds. Chris Shaw is the excavations manager at the La Brea Tar Pits. He's found a lot of Smilodon bones with scrapes and fractures that may have come from the horns, teeth, or hooves of prey animals. In this drawer here, we have an excellent example of a chest injury. This is the breastbone itself, which has been fused. And along here is cartilage that has been also ossified in a, in a hugely traumatic injury, probably caused by, uh, well, by actually attacking an animal larger than itself. And it wasn't just the prey animals causing the damage they would have fought with other predators, and the cats no doubt fought and injured each other. In this drawer, we have shoulder blades of saber-toothed cats, and these shoulder blades show an indication of a traumatic injury that was probably the result of interaction between two saber-toothed cats. There are plenty of reasons why saber-toothed cats might have fought. Overkills, for instance, or territory. Or, like lions, they might have fought for control of a pride. And that presumes that Smilodon was a social animal, that it lived and hunted in groups. And you can see that normally the head of the thigh bone is very much rounded like a golf ball. Well, this has been flattened down so severely that this animal could not have walked effectively, let alone hunted effectively, on this limb element. Traumatic injuries like this one, to me, are very, very good evidence for sociability and uh, cooperative behavior in animals like the saber-toothed cat. Unless other members of the pride had been bringing it food, how would a crippled Smilodon survive long enough to stumble, eventually, into a tar pit? Most scientists, though, are still convinced that Smilodon was a loner. 
The large numbers of injured smilodon that we find at the tar pits suggest that these animals were social. But I also think that these injured smilodon, even though they may not have been great hunters, they still would have been very good scavengers, and they still would have been very good at coming up to a group of dire wolves on a carcass and threatening them just by looking at them, basically, and opening their mouths. And the dire wolves would have left, and they would have been able to live by scavenging off the kills of other carnivores. The fact of the matter is that there's very little evidence that any animals except people do very much to take care of injured individuals. Lions generally leave injured pack members. They don't take care of them. So my suspicion is that no, sociality is not necessary to account for the injuries that we've seen. The evidence so far confirms that Smilodon was a powerful, lone ambush killer. But the mystery that still intrigues the Smilodon team above all is how did it use its lethal teeth?